Forlaget Limoel Books udgiver i denne uge biolog Robert Tjelbrigts bog Videnskabens bedrag, hvor i han gør op med den generelle forestilling, at naturvidenskaben er i stand til at give svar på alting. Ligesom hans tidligere bog Morfisk Resonans har videnskabens bedrag afsted kommet rystels og stor debat dybt ind i den videnskabelige verden. I kan blandt andet se uh, hans forbudte uh, TED Talk på YouTube, men det kan jeg fortælle om senere. Da Robert for nylig besøgte Danmark, fik jeg mulighed for at få et interview med ham, og mit ærne her er egentlig at prøve at dække andre vinkler af hans arbejde, end det man normalt ser på YouTube. Om det lykkes, det håber jeg. I hver skal god fornøjelse. Welcome to Cosmoporta, and it is a huge pleasure and honor to welcome Rupert Sheldrake. And uh, today his, his latest book, uh, Science Delusion, is released in Denmark, and that's why we are here. Uh, Rupert, there's one thing I would like to, to ask you firstly. As a biologist, uh, a scientist yourself, when was the first time that you you really realized that you had to to adopt a new or invent or whatever a new kind of view on what you were doing and your fellow scientists i think the first shock to my system that made me question things was hmm. when i was 17 I, i had a gap year before going to cambridge after leaving school and I wanted to become a scientist. Yeah. So I asked various drug companies in England if they had a job as a temporary lamp technician so I could get some research experience. Um, and one of them said, yes, uh, you can work for six months. Uh, we have a temporary post. And so I was very happy. I had a job. Um, I was doing research. It was in a drug company. It was to try and help human lives and save lives and so on. Mm-hmm. But when I arrived there, I discovered it was a vivisection laboratory. Uh, oh. It was like a death camp oh. for animals. Oh, wow. Every day, hundreds of rats and mice and guinea pigs were poisoned or experimented on. Mm. And at the end of every day, as the most junior technician, it was my job to gas the survivors. Oh. So it was a kind of animal holocaust. <laughs> and I was... Um, I become a biologist because I was so I loved animals and yeah. plants. So that's why I was doing biology. Mm. So this set up a tremendous conflict in me because I was told when I when I said, you know, what are we doing to these animals? They said, well this is for the good of humanity. These animals can't really feel and you know and um, uh, they're just you know we're, we're just being objective scientists. Emotions should play no part in it. We're finding out facts. Um, i realized there was something had gone wrong with science. It mm. wasn't as I thought it was. Already be. then? Yes, yeah, you had that because uh, the conflict, I felt mm. such a strong conflict mm. between what I was doing and what made me want to be a biologist, namely loving animals and plants. Um, and when I was an undergraduate at Cambridge, I found this mechanistic approach to life ever more alienating. Of course. I was good at it. I mean, I did, had good exam results and all that. Um, I was a scholar of my college and... um, But um, I I tried to find something else and then a friend of mine who was studying German literature told me about Goethe and Goethe's ideas on science, a more Mm. holistic science. And this at once appealed to me. I thought, wow, it it might be possible to do science in a different way. that doesn't just involve destroying things and cutting them up and Mm. reducing them to their smallest parts. Mm -hmm. Um, But Goethe was writing in the early 19th century and it was hard to connect what he was doing with what I might feasibly do in the Mm. late 20th century. Um, So I felt a need to stand back and look at the bigger picture because I was offered a place for a PhD, I wanted to do a PhD in science, Mm. part of me wanted to do it. The other part made me think, well, do I really want to do biology at all Mm. if it's all about killing things and not really about life? Mm. Uh, So I was fortunate to get a year, uh, a a fellowship for a year at Harvard, uh, and there I studied history and philosophy of science. And that was an attempt to see the bigger picture. It was soon after Thomas Kuhn's famous book, The Structure of Scientific Revolutions, had been published which 
gave the idea that at any given time science has a paradigm, a model of reality. Mm. Um, but these shift in times of revolution, you get new models of reality. And I realized that the mechanistic theory wasn't the truth, mm. the ultimate truth about life. It was a theory, mm. a temporary theory that could change. Then I saw the vision of doing something about it and I hoped for a new kind of science, but I didn't know what it might be. So mm. that was really, it was a process that started from when I was 17. And despite that, you, you kept on going and you kept uh, yes, uh, studying? Yes, despite and that, I went back to Cambridge and did my PhD, but I, 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 I wanted to do it with plants, not animals, because mm. I didn't want to spend my whole career no, no, of course animals. No. So uh, by working on plants, uh, the development of form in plants, mm. I was able to connect with the kind of Goethe's interests in plant yeah. form and morphology. Yeah, yeah. Could, was uh, that uh, something you could do with the knowledge of your professors and stuff like that? Taking no, I Goethe didn't in? mention Goethe. No, no. So um, it was kind of contradictory in a, in a way. The, the well, way you were... the atmosphere was reductionist. It was in a biochemistry department. Mm -hmm. um, but I worked on the plant hormone auxin, um, which has a kind of integrative role in plants. Mm -hmm. And I also ro worked on death and dying cells and how dying cells produce the hormone auxin that gives rise to more life. That was a very oh. Gertian theme, yeah, yeah. death within yes. life and mm. the death within life giving more life. Yeah. Um, that I found very satisfying mm -hmm. part of my research. <laughs> yeah. But I never mentioned Goethe. And, no. Uh, well, partly because, not because I was trying to hide it, but most people in the biochemistry department didn't, didn't know, know anything who, about who Goethe was. No. Strange, though. Eh? Well, in Germany they would have done, but in England, yeah, yeah. no. Yeah, no. Yeah. Hmm. So, um, um, was there at any time that you, you thought that uh, you wanted to quit this or try to approach some, uh, something else? Uh, well, I, 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 with my work in Cambridge on plant growth, I was. I like that. I mean, mm. I'm very. I'm still very keen mm. on plants. I spend mm. part of every day looking at plants. It's mm. a, a passion of mine. Yeah. Plant form. So I was very happy to be working with plants mm. and trying to understand their form and their mm. growth. Um, but I did reach the point where I felt that I, to do it in the context of biochemistry in this very reductionist atmosphere, didn't really work for mm. me. At that stage, I'd got interested in tropical botany and in um, Indian culture, because I spent a year at uh, the University of Malaya studying tropical mm. plants. Yeah. I travelled through India on the way there. That was in 1968. It was a very exciting time to be in India. Mm. Um, and I was fell in love with Indian culture and became very intrigued by it. <coughs> so... Does uh, that have something to do with, with uh, something spiritual or kind of? Uh, because y when you go to India, that's something that hits you very. Oh yes, on a, it on was, a grand it was for me. It was a kind of spiritual yeah. awakening, yeah. Yeah. because I'd absorbed the kind of atheistic mm. um, belief system of my scientific yeah. colleagues yeah. And, and teachers, and which had blocked out the whole realm yeah. of the spirit. And in India, I saw a culture where the spirit was part of ordinary life yeah, in a everywhere. way that I'd never encountered before. But still then, you you, you must ha have had it in you. Uh, from. Have you any recollection of you uh, as, a, as a younger, as a child or something, being in any way religious or have any urge to, to, to see in that direction? Oh, yes. I mean, I was brought up by Christian parents okay. and, uh, in an atmosphere of prayer. Okay. Um, I was brought up going to church and mm -hmm. I to sing every Sunday. I was at a boarding school where I, in the Church of England tradition, we have a wonderful musical mm -hmm. tradition. I was mm -hmm. a chorister okay. uh, in the choir. Mm -hmm. And so I got to know the whole church music tradition. I sang in cathedrals in, choir, in the choir. Uh, our school choir sang in several of our great mm -hmm. British cathedrals. So um, all of that I found wonderfully inspiring. Mm. And um, so, uh, but my scientific education made me think, oh, that's all rubbish. You yeah. know, the only thing that counts are facts and mm -hmm. theories and molecules. But still you had the other thing. Between. Oh, yes, but it was, it was sort of latent. Or and to me that sounds like the, the, the perfect scientist of, of the future already because and 
I think you need to have both in order to to balance any view, yes. whatever way you're going. Or oh, quite. Well, I agree. Mm. I think you need to have both. Your book and your books have been right, quite. Uh, what do you call it? Uh, ex extraordinary and, and uh, controversial. Yes. And um, how, how have you? Uh, did, uh, how do you? Exp how have you experienced that? Uh, being a scientist and, and being doing the work. With, it must have been a choice you knew that you took when you wrote that those books, like the morphic resonance and the latest uh, science delusion. You, you by yes. that time you you must have known that by doing this, this is uh, this is a break with with. Yes. The well, I've thought of the idea of morphic resonance habit, mm. in nature, memory, yeah. and nature, when I was in Cambridge, yeah. working on plants, mm -hmm. and I realised I couldn't really develop that idea within the context of the biochemistry department or any other department. Um, so, I, and I knew that if I'd published it, it would be an end to my ordinary scientific career, mm -hmm. because yeah. science is very con conventional and yeah. conservative. Um, so I wanted to be sure about it. So yeah. I left my job in Cambridge, and I took a job in an international agricultural institute in India. Okay. So I could be in India, I could <laughs> work on plants in the field, holistically, because agriculture has to be holistic. Yeah. <coughs> You're dealing with real plants in mm. real fields grown by real people in real weather. Mm. <coughs> and um, I also wanted to be in India because I was very drawn to the culture mm. and also the spiritual yeah. traditions. Yeah. So for me, this was um, uh, something that enabled me to do some useful science, do science I found very engaging, mm. think, go on thinking about morphic resonance. Yeah. And for after another five years, after first thinking of the idea, I felt confident enough to publish it. Mm. And then I took a couple of years off to write my first book, A New Science of Life. Yeah. Um, and then um, when it came out, that really did change my scientific career because I couldn't go back to being no, a standard academic after yeah. that. And I didn't know what would happen. Would it be possible to survive? Would I be able to get lab space? Mm. How could I go on doing research? All of this was yes. quite unknown. Of course. But luckily, um, things have turned out so that I have been able to survive. Yeah. I have had people support my research with financially. I have been able to do uh, a long series of experiments. Yeah. And also, we know, all know Einstein's, uh, the quote of Einstein, that uh, we cannot really solve problems with the same way of thinking that created them. Mm. And uh, it seems to me that what we really need is a new way of thinking. Mm. And I, the, I think that your work and your books are part of this new, mm. what you would call a new uh, movement. Mm. Uh, but have, you, have you made any sympathy? from the scientific world uh, in your work uh, and with, uh, trying to do this uh, break up and trying to open up the... Well, yes, I've, I've had quite a lot of sympathy, actually. Um, and support also, like... You well, know. support, but the thing is there's a very big difference between what happens in private and what happens in of public. Course, yeah. In private, mm. I have many mm. scientific friends yeah. Um, I still regularly dine on high table in my college in Cambridge. Mm -hmm. I'm always received in a very friendly way. Um, um, some of my friends from when I worked in Cambridge have Nobel Prizes. Some mm. of them, have, one of them was president of the Royal Society. Mm -hmm. So I know some of the most eminent scientists in the world mm -hmm. on friendly terms. You know, mm -hmm. we have dinner together. we yeah. but. I know that if I mention our friendship in public, mm. it would embarrass them because I'm so controversial. <laughs> and so they don't mention me in public. No. And I, out of respect for them and their careers, you I don't, don't mention them. them. <laughs> so I'm basically dangerous to know. Mm. Um, and, but it's a different matter in private. And mm. I have many scientists that I... Yes, yes. You know, have, have friends with. 
who advised me on experiments, who helped me with the statistical analysis mm. of my experiments, yeah. who um, advised me on laboratory techniques and mm. so on. Mm. So I have a whole network of people mm. who are supporters, but it's all under the surface. Yeah. How do you reckon your own work in, in this? I mean, I'm not as a biologist, but what do you call yourself doing the stuff you're doing now with the books? Uh, you are kind of... Uh, Uh, what what would you call it? Icebreaker, uh, breaker of new grounds. Mm. Um, it's it's pioneer work you're mm. doing in many ways. How much have have you uh, been counting on? For example, the Vedas, the old Indian Upanishads and stuff like that. Old Indian uh, literature uh, of spiritual literature. Uh, mm. Is that something that has played a part in your in your work? Have you been inspired from there? Well, I've been inspired by the, the Upanishads in, in, in the view of consciousness they yeah. put forward, yeah. um, which really forms, forms the basis of my own understanding. And in many ways are also quite scientific, yes. in a way. It's uh, based on studying consciousness from yeah. within, and yeah. it's the only way you can study yeah, it. Yeah, of course. Um, so, uh, yes, but my own research on morphic resonance the idea of a memory in nature, although mm. it's a common idea in India, I didn't get the idea from Indian philosophy because I already had it when I first yeah. went to mm. India. Mm. Um, it came about through thinking about evolution and inheritance. Yeah. And the main philosophical influence was Henri Bergson, the mm. French philosopher. Yes, yes. Um, so it, really I got the, the, my most fundamental scientific ideas through the Western tradition, mm -hmm. I later discovered they fitted quite well yeah, with yeah, Eastern yeah. thought. Mm -hmm. um, some of my research on things like telepathy and um, the sense of being stared at mm. um, didn't really come from Eastern thought. I mean, although Indians take these things for granted, mm. there's not much written about them in no. Indian literature, no. as far as I know. Mm -hmm. I mean, they, they, they become cities. They're part of... In the Yoga Sutras of Pat and John, yeah. he talks about these yeah. kinds of powers. Mm. Um, but there, I was more influenced by the tradition of psychical research, mm. and empirical investigation, again from the Western tradition. Okay. Um, the dogmas that you have uh, shown in the latest book, uh, the Science Delusion, uh, that tells about um, how the mechanic worldview and the mechanic uh, uh, and that consciousness is almost non-existent uh, it's all in the mind and in the brain and yes. uh, have you ever uh, have you seen the uh, read the book of uh, dr eben alexander You, um, have I you know heard about it? I yeah. know about it. I haven't yeah. actually read it. No, but I know because I was eager to know your view about it because he he was uh, you know he was a brain uh, yes uh, scientist and he he also held that view that everything was could be accounted yes. to for the inner brain, but he discovered something else yes. during his near death, and I think um, he's also one of those uh, who 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 his whose testimony from from it experience, personal experience, is is of great value yes, for agree. what you are talking about also. Yes. So, the the strange thing to me is that if somebody came up to to you or to me or someone and said, can you see that chair over there? Mm. And we, we would probably both of us say, yes, we can mm. see the chair. And he said, can you also see the angel sitting in the chair? Mm -hmm. And most people would maybe say, no, we can't. Mm. But because you and I can't see it, but there's a whole lot of other people who can mm. see it, does that mean it doesn't exist? And I, I think that's a, a good question, That because we cannot see it, but somebody else can. Does it mean that it doesn't exist? Or is that, is that just for us? How do you... Because there's well. so many people... Nowadays, opening up, as I experience it, uh, ch children, young people who opens up to to new, uh, they it, they develop new um, uh, ways of perception 
that uh, maybe have been closed down for, for, for the older generation for years? Well, I suppose it depends on what, what state of consciousness you're in. I mean, in our dreams, mm. we all see things that yeah, other people don't mm. see, but yeah. which we see. Mm. So we're all familiar with that. Mm. Um, if you take a powerful hallucinogen like LSD, you mm -hmm. see things that uh -huh. other people may not see. <laughs> yeah. um, and um, so, you know, it's hard to know, isn't it? When people see an angel, in a sense, it's a construction of their own mind, but in a sense, everything we see is a construction yeah, yeah, of our Yeah, yeah, that's minds. what I mean. Yeah. Um, so whether they're sensing a presence of something which they then clothe in visual imagery, um, or whether it's entirely hallucinatory or dreamlike, I mean, I mean, it's hard to have a general answer for that. But isn't it also because we the 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 expressions we have of things, how we term things, that, that everything is in a way breaking up at the moment because. We have a we when you say God, for example, you have to determine and to 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 define what do you mean by yes. that expression, and that goes for a lot of other things too. Yes. That uh, what means one thing to one person means something different for another person. Yes. So the whole scientist scientific kind of catalog of what things are and aren't uh, are more or less falling apart. Well, not within in that the way. world of institutional no, science. No, because They're one being thing... being propped up by dogmas. Yeah, and theories. Yes. But we are now talking about people who really experience something. Yes. And who is... Uh, for example, I had um, a teacher who, were, who was able to um, diagnose people uh, through the telephone, and it didn't matter if they were on the other side of the... Mm. the and uh, to him it was quite ordinary thing. And, uh, but, but if you went to some sane people and, no, it's not possible, it could not be. Yes. So, aren't we at that point where we have to um, adjust to that we have a lot of uh, things that are not yet unfolded within people? Oh, well, yeah, I mean, I think that's, I certainly agree with that. There's, there's a huge amount going on that isn't on the scientific map. Yeah. There is an expansion of the scientific worldview through what's now called consciousness studies. Mm -hmm. So this is an area of science where there is a kind of opening up, mm. um, but it's still fairly limited, and it's hard for people in that area to get their work funded. Mm. Um, but certainly within science there are people who are interested in this, partly because many scientists themselves now meditate or have had mystical experiences, yes, yeah. or have psychic pets, mm. or have taken um, psychedelics, and it's changed their world view. Mm. Um, so there are quite a lot of people within the scientific world who have a personal interest in these mm. things. Usually they have to keep it quiet, not tell their colleagues, because they're afraid that they'll think they're weird. Mm. Um, but it does give them a motivation to do this research if they get the chance. And that's partly a matter of finding ways of funding mm. this sort of yeah, research. Yeah. Is there anything or else, uh, Rupert, you would like to, to that we should, uh, before we close down, to, to something that you um, liked, we, we, we needed to? Well, <coughs> I'm here in Denmark to speak to, at the University of Aarhus. Mm -hmm. One of the um, things that I'm trying to encourage scientists to do yeah. is to come out of the closet. Yeah. Because I meet all the time scientists who are interested in the kinds of things we've been talking yeah. about. Mm -hmm. And yet almost all of them say, I can't discuss this with my colleagues because they're all so straight. Mm. Um, I went to one... Um, I gave a seminar at Cambridge University in a small department where there were six scientists and um, several graduate students. And I was talking about my research on dogs that know when their owners are coming home. Yeah. And they listened politely and they asked a few technical questions about statistics and methods and so mm, on, mm. which is fair enough, just like an ordinary scientific seminar. But afterwards, during the tea break, one after another, 
they came up to me and uh, you know, one, they'd look to see that nobody was listening. <laughs> they'd holding their cup of tea and they... <laughs> and the first one said, you know, I'm so glad you talked about that. When I was a child, we had a dog that knew when my father was coming home. And that's why I got interested in researching with animals. That's why I'm here. <coughs> but then he said, I can't tell my colleagues because they're all so straight, you see. Then the next one came up and, so, the, the, and said, <laughs> you know, I've got a dog that knows when I'm coming home from the lab, just like you said, you know, but I can't tell my colleagues because they're all so straight. <laughs> and and they, they all came up and told mm. me these stories mm. and they all said, I can't tell my colleagues because mm. they're all so straight. So I said to them, you know, when uh, they, I'd heard from every one of them, including the professor, mm. I said, why don't you guys come out? Because yeah. you'd have so much more fun. Yeah, you know, of course. It's like gays in the 1950s, yeah. Yeah. all pretending to be straight when they're not, yeah. having a secret private yeah. life. Mm. And I think that here in Denmark, there'll be many scientists, perhaps even a majority, who have an interest in who've had mystical experiences, out-of-the-body experiences, psychedelic openings, mm. uh, who meditate, who pray, mm. who've been on pilgrimages, who mm. um, have some kind of spiritual interest or uh, uh, things that go beyond the narrow limits of mechanistic yep. science. And I wouldn't mind betting that most of them don't talk to their colleagues about it. Not. So what I'm going to try and suggest in the university here is that they come out of the closet with their friends and colleagues and speak more freely to each other. Because mm. I think what would happen is they'd realize that there are many people who are curious about these things. Of course. And the pretense that these, you can't talk about these, the, the observing of these taboos mm. is actually strengthening the taboos. The taboos are yeah. kept in place by fear. And if you can let go of that fear and talk freely, yeah life would be much more fun, and I think it would ha help to regenerate science and make it more interesting. I mean, if not, if a scientist isn't curious, who should be then? I mean, they, that should be uh, the, the... Well, exactly, thing. but you yeah. see, the curiosity of scientists is channeled to a very narrow focus. Yeah. You know, is this enzyme activated by calcium or magnesium ions? <laughs> or does this enzyme put a phosphate group on this bit of this mm. molecule? Um, yeah. Very, very narrow focus. Um, um, there are scientists like cosmologists who think in bigger terms, but um, most science is narrowly specialized. And I think that there has to be a way in which scientists can think and discuss and open up to the mm. picture. Yeah. And I think it would make science more attractive to young people, yeah. make the research more interesting. Yeah. And probably make it cheaper too, because holistic research is generally cheaper than uh, reductionist yeah, research. Yeah. The most reductionist research of all, looking into subatomic particles, requires large hadron colliders costing billions of euros. Mm. Whereas if you're studying consciousness of someone who's meditating, all you mm. need is someone who's meditating. <laughs> yeah. Or you can start meditating yourself. Or you can start doing it yourself. Yeah. Maybe it's time for everybody to come out of the closet and trying to to play with reality in its all its aspects. Thank you very much Rupert for Thank for you. doing this talk. Keep Thank up the good work. Thank you very much. Og husk at videnskabens bedrag uh, er udgivet på Lemuel Books og kan købes på lemuelbooks.com.